Ruben Gonzalez goes for Olympic gold. Ever since third grade, Ruben Gonzalez had wanted to be an Olympic athlete. He respected the Olympians because they were an example of what he believed in. They are willing to commit to a goal, risk adversity in the pursuit of it, and fail and keep trying until they succeed. But it was not until he was in college and saw Scott Hamilton compete in the 1984 Sarajevo Games that he actually made the decision to train for the Olympics. Ruben said to himself, If that little guy can do it, I can do it too. I'm going to be in the next Olympics. It's a done deal. I just have to find a sport. After doing a little research on Olympic sports, Ruben decided he needed to pick a sport that would build on his strengths. He knew that he was a good athlete, but not a great athlete. His strength was perseverance. He never quit anything. In fact, he had earned the nickname Bulldog in high school. He figured he had to find a sport so tough, a sport with so many broken bones, that there would be a lot of quitters. That way, maybe, he could rise to the top on the attrition rate. He finally settled on the luge. Next, he wrote Sports Illustrated, that was before the Internet, and asked, Where do you go to learn how to luge? They wrote back, Lake Placid, New York. That's where they had the Olympics in 1936 and 1980. That's where the track is. Reuben picked up the phone and called Lake Placid. I'm an athlete in Houston, and I want to learn how to luge so I can be in the Olympics in four years. Will you help me? The guy who answered the phone asked, How old are you? Twenty-one years old. Twenty-one? You're way too old. You're ten years too late. We start them when they're ten years old. Forget it. But Reuben couldn't forget it, and he started to tell the man his life story to buy some time until he thought of something. Along the way, he happened to say that he was born in Argentina. All of a sudden, the man on the other end of the phone got excited. Argentina? Why didn't you say so? If you'll go for Argentina, we'll help you. It turns out the sport of luge was in danger of being dropped from the Olympics because there weren't enough countries competing on the international level. If you'll go for Argentina and somehow we can get you into the top 50 ranked losers in the world in four years, which is what you'll need to make it into the Olympics. It would add one more country to the sport of luge, and that would make it a stronger sport. If you make it, you'd be helping the U.S. team. Then he added, Before you come all the way to Lake Placid, you have to know two things. Number one, if you want to do it at your age, and you want to do it in only four years, it'll be brutal. Nine out of every ten guys quit. Number two, Expect to break some bones. Reuben thought, Great, this works right into my plan. I'm not a quitter. The harder it is, the easier it is for me. A few days later, Reuben Gonzalez was walking down Main Street in Lake Placid, looking for the U.S. Olympic Training Center. A day later, he was in a beginner's class with 14 other aspiring Olympians. The first day was miserable, and he even thought of quitting. But with the help of his friend Craig, he recommitted to his Olympic dream, and, though all fourteen of the other aspirants eventually quit before the end of the first season, Reuben finished the summer training. Four grueling years later, Reuben Gonzalez realized his dream when he walked into the opening ceremonies of the 1988 Calgary Winter Olympics. He returned again in Albertville in 1992 and Salt Lake City for the 2000 Winter Games. Ruben Gonzalez, because he took immediate and persistent action on his dream, will always be a three-time Olympian. And as many Olympians do, Ruben has gone on to have a successful career as a motivational speaker. Successful people have a bias for action. Most successful people I know have a low tolerance for excessive planning and talking about it. They are antsy to get going. They want to get started. They want the games to begin. A good example of this is my friend Bob Kriegel's son, Otis. When Otis came home for the summer with his new girlfriend after his freshman year in college, they both began looking for jobs. While Otis just picked up the phone and started calling around to see who might need someone, 
His girlfriend spent the first week writing and rewriting her resume. By the end of the second day, Otis had landed a job. His girlfriend was still rewriting her resume. Otis just got into action. He figured if someone asked him for a resume, he'd deal with it then. Planning has its place, but it must be kept in perspective. Some people spend their whole lives waiting for the perfect time to do something. There's rarely a perfect time to do anything. What is important is to just get started. Get into the game. Get on the playing field. Once you do, you will start to get feedback that will help you make the corrections you need to make to be successful. Once you are in action, you will start learning at a much more rapid rate. Ready, fire, aim. Most people are familiar with the phrase, ready, aim, fire. The problem is that too many people spend their whole life aiming and never firing. They are always getting ready, getting it perfect. The quickest way to hit a target is to fire, see where the bullet landed, and then adjust your aim accordingly. If the hit was two inches above the target, lower your aim a little. Fire again. See where it is now. Keep firing and keep readjusting. Soon you are hitting the bullseye. The same is true for anything. When we started marketing the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, it occurred to me that it would be a good idea to give away free excerpts from the book to small and local newspapers in exchange for them printing a box at the end of the story telling people that the story was excerpt from Chicken Soup for the Soul, which was available at their local bookstore or by calling our 800 number. I had never done this before, so I wasn't sure if there was a correct way to submit a story to a newspaper or magazine. So I just sent off a story from the book entitled, Remember You Are Raising Children, Not Flowers, that I had written about my neighbor and his son, along with a cover letter to the editor of L.A. Parent Magazine. The letter read, September 13, 1993, Jack Bierman, L.A. Parent. Dear Jack, I would like to submit this article for publication in L.A. Parent. I have enclosed a brief bio. I would like you to print the little blurb I included on my new book, Chicken Soup for the Soul, with my article. If you would like a copy of the book, I would be more than happy to send one to you. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Jack Canfield. A few weeks later, I received the following letter back. Dear Jack, I was annoyed by your facts. How dare you tell me to include the little blurb on your book? How could you assume I'd be interested in this little bit of unsolicited word processing? Then I read the article. Needless to say, I'll run your little blurb and then some. I was moved by this exercise, and am sure it will touch the hearts of our 200,000-plus readers from here to San Diego. Has it ever appeared anywhere in my demographic? If so, where? I look forward to working with you on raising children not flowers. Best regards, Jack Bierman, Editor-in-Chief. I had not known how to submit a proper query letter to an editor. There was an accepted format that I was unaware of. But I took action anyway. In a subsequent phone call, Jack Bierman generously taught me the correct way to submit an article to a magazine. He gave me feedback on how to do it better next time. Now I was in the game and I was learning from my experience. Ready, fire, aim. Within a month, I had submitted that same article to over 50 local and regional parenting magazines all across the United States. Thirty-five of them published it, introducing Chicken Soup for the Soul to over six million parents. Do it now. My mentor, W. Clement Stone, used to hand out lapel pins that said, do it now. When you have an inspired impulse to take action, do it now. Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, said, There are three keys to success. One, being at the right place at the right time. Two, knowing you are there. Three, taking action. On March 24, 1975, Chuck Wepner, a relatively unknown 30-to-1 underdog, did what no one thought he could do. 
he went 15 rounds with the world heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali. In the ninth round, he reached Ali's chin with the right hand, knocking the champion to the ground, shocking both Ali and the fans watching the fight. Wapner was only seconds away from being the world's heavyweight champion. However, Ali recovered and went on to win the 15-round bout and retain his title. Over a thousand miles away, a struggling actor named Sylvester Stallone watched the fight on a newly purchased television set. Though Stallone had contemplated the idea of writing a screenplay about a down-and-out fighter getting a title shot before he saw the ali Wepner fight, he didn't think it was plausible. But after seeing Wepner, who most people didn't know, fighting the most well-known fighter of all time, all he thought was, get me a pencil. He began to write that night, and three days later, he had completed the script for Rocky, which went on to win three Oscars, including one for Best Picture, thus launching Stallone's multi-million dollar movie career. Imagination means nothing without doing. Charlie Chaplin, actor, comedian, and filmmaker. Give me a break. A story is told of a man who goes to church and prays. God, I need a break. I need to win the state lottery. I'm counting on you, God. Having not won the lottery, the man returns to church a week later and once again prays. God, about that state lottery. I've been kind to my wife. I've given up drinking. I've been really good. Give me a break. Let me win the lottery. A week later, still no richer, he returns to pray once again. God, I don't seem to be getting through to you on this state lottery thing. I've been using positive self-talk, saying affirmations and visualizing the money. Give me a break, God. Let me win the lottery. Suddenly, the heavens open up. Light and heavenly music flood into the church, and a deep voice says, My son, give me a break. Buy a lottery ticket. Fail forward. No man ever became great or good, except through many and great mistakes. William E. Gladstone, former Prime Minister of Great Britain Many people fail to take action because they're afraid to fail. Successful people, on the other hand, realize that failure is an important part of the learning process. They know that failure is just a way we learn by trial and error. Not only do we need to stop being so afraid of failure, but we also need to be willing to fail, even eager to fail. I call this kind of instructive failure failing forward. Simply get started, make mistakes, listen to the feedback, correct, and keep moving forward toward the goal. Every experience will yield more useful information that you can apply the next time. This principle is perhaps demonstrated most compellingly in the area of startup businesses. For instance, venture capitalists know that most businesses fail. But in the venture capital industry, a new statistic is emerging. If the founding entrepreneur is 55 years or older, the business has a 73% better chance of survival. These older entrepreneurs have already learned from their mistakes. They're simply a better risk because through a lifetime of learning from their failures, they have developed a knowledge base, a skill set, and a self-confidence that better enables them to move through the obstacles to success. You can never learn less. You can only learn more. The reason I know so much is because I have made so many mistakes. Buckminster Fuller, mathematician and philosopher who never graduated from college, but received 46 honorary doctorates. One of my favorite stories is about a famous research scientist who had made several very important medical breakthroughs. He was being interviewed by a newspaper reporter who asked him why he thought he was able to achieve so much more than the average person. In other words, what set him so far apart from others? He responded that it all came from a lesson his mother had taught him when he was two years old. He'd been trying to take a bottle of milk out of the refrigerator when he lost his grip and spilled the entire contents on the kitchen floor. His mother, instead of scolding him, said, 
What a wonderful mess you've made. I've rarely seen such a huge puddle of milk. Well, the damage is already done. Would you like to get down and play in the milk before we clean it up? Indeed, he did. And after a few minutes, his mother continued, You know, whenever you make a mess like this, eventually you have to clean it up. So, how would you like to do that? We could use a towel, sponge, or mop. Which do you prefer? After they were finished cleaning up the milk, she said, What we have here is a failed experiment in how to carry a big bottle of milk with two tiny hands. Let's go out in the backyard, fill the bottle with water, and see if you can discover a way to carry it without dropping it. And they did. What a wonderful lesson. The scientist then remarked that it was at that moment that he knew he didn't have to be afraid to make mistakes. Instead, he learned that mistakes are just opportunities for learning something new, which, after all, is what scientific experiments are all about. That bottle of spilled milk led to a lifetime of learning experiences, experiences that were the building blocks of a lifetime of world-renowned successes and medical breakthroughs. Principle 14. Just lean into it. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Ancient Chinese proverb. Oftentimes, success happens when you just lean into it. When you make yourself open to opportunities and are willing to do what it takes to pursue it further, without a contract, without a promise of success, without any expectation whatsoever, you just start. You lean into it. You see what it feels like, and you find out if you want to keep going. Instead of sitting on the sidelines deliberating, reflecting, and contemplating, leaning into it creates momentum. One of the most extraordinary benefits of just leaning into it is that you begin creating momentum, that unseen energy force that brings more opportunity, more resources, and more people who can help you into your life at seemingly just the right time for you to benefit the most from them. Many of the best-known acting careers, entrepreneurial pursuits, philanthropic projects, and other overnight successes happened because someone responded favorably to the question, Have you ever considered, or, Could I convince you to, or, Would you be willing to take a look at, they leaned into it. You can't cross a sea by merely staring into the water. Rabindranath Tagore, 1913 Nobel Laureate for Literature Be willing to start without seeing the whole path. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. Martin Luther King, Jr., Legendary Civil Rights Leader Nobel Peace Prize recipient. Of course, just leaning into a project or opportunity also means you must be willing to start without necessarily seeing the entire pathway from the beginning. You must be willing to lean into it and see how it unfolds. Often we have a dream, and because we can't see how we're going to achieve it, we are afraid to start, afraid to commit ourselves, because the path is unclear and the outcome is uncertain. But leaning into it requires that you be willing to explore, to enter unknown waters, trusting that a port will appear. Simply start. Then keep taking what feel like logical next steps, and the journey will ultimately take you to where you want to go, or even someplace better. Sometimes you don't even have to have a clear dream. From as early as she could remember, Janice Stanfield wanted to be a singer. She didn't know where her dream would eventually lead her, but she knew she had to find out. She leaned into it and took some singing lessons, then eventually got a job singing weekends at a local country club. She leaned into it a little more, and at 26 years old, she packed her bags for Nashville, Tennessee, to pursue her dream of becoming a songwriter and recording artist. Three long years she lived and worked in Nashville, seeing hundreds of more brilliant, talented, and deserving performers than there were record deals to be had. 
Jana began to see the music industry as a room full of slot machines that paid out just enough to keep you playing. A producer loves your work. An artist considers your song for her next album. And maybe a record company tells you you're great. But rarely do the slot machines pay off with the big jackpot, the coveted recording contract. After several years of working at a record promotion company to learn the business from the inside out, Jana had to face facts. There were no guarantees. She could play the slots forever and grow old in Nashville. Finally, she admitted to herself that continuing to try to get a record deal was like pounding her head against a wall. She didn't realize at the time that often when you lean into it, roadblocks are put in your path to force you into a different path, a path that may be truer to your real purpose. For every failure, there's an alternative course of action. You just have to find it. When you come to a roadblock, take a detour. Mary Kay Ash, founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics. Looking for her underlying motivation. Jana had learned what many achievers have, that even when you can't move forward, you can turn right or you can turn left, but you have to keep moving. She discovered through some personal development courses that sometimes, in the rush to fulfill our dreams, we get caught up in what we think is the only form that will satisfy that dream. In Jana's case, a recording contract. But as Jana would soon learn, there are many ways to accomplish your goal if you know what you're really pursuing. Because underneath her desire to land a record deal was a deeper motivating need, the real motivation for her dream, to use her music to uplift, inspire, and offer hope to people. I want to combine music, comedy, storytelling, and motivation with what I'm here for, she wrote in her journal. I am an artist, and my art is unfolding before me. The roadblock that blocked my path has been lifted. Emboldened by this new insight, Jana began to play anywhere people would let her. Where two or more are gathered, I will bring my guitar, became her motto. She played in living rooms, driveways, schools, churches, anywhere she could. I'm not lost. I'm just exploring. But Jana was still at a loss to figure out how to combine her talents in a way that would be helpful to people and pay her a modest income. There was no one out there already doing what she wanted to do, combining music, comedy, storytelling, and motivation. There was no career path already laid out to follow, no footsteps to walk in. She was charting new territory. She didn't know where she was going or what form it would ultimately take but she kept leaning into it. Keep leaning, and the path will appear. Jana began to work odd jobs, always leaning into it, trying to figure out how to turn her passion for her art and her desire to help people into something she could make a living from. I'm willing to use my gifts to make this world a better place, she wrote in her journal. I don't know exactly how to use my gifts to do this, but I have let God know that I am ready. Again, she leaned into it. Jana called churches, saying, If you would let me come and sing two songs in your service, it will give you a chance to get to know me and how I might be helpful. Then in a few months, maybe you'd like to have me come back and do a concert in the afternoon. The Turning Point After just two or three songs, church members would approach her and ask if she had her songs on tape. There was one song, If I Had Only Known, that people requested more than any other. They'd say, I noticed a lot of people crying when you played that song. I've had a loss that's so painful that I can't cry here at church because I don't know if I can put myself back together once I start. Would you make me a copy of this song so I can have it when I'm alone and really feel the feelings you're bringing to me? Jana spent a lot of time making cassettes and mailing them to people, but all the while her friends kept telling her to make an album. You've got all these demos of songs you recorded when you were trying to get a record deal, they said. Just take your demos and make an album. Jana thought, Oh, I couldn't do that. It wouldn't be a real album with a real record company. It wouldn't really count. It would just show what a failure I've been. 
but her friends kept after her, and eventually Jana leaned into it one more time. She paid an engineer $100 to put together ten of her songs, which she playfully referred to as a compilation of my top ten most rejected songs. She made the covers at Kinko's and reproduced 100 cassettes, which she now laughingly recalls she thought would be a lifetime supply. As she traveled from living room to living room and tiny church to tiny church, she set out her cassettes on a card table and sold them after her performance. Then came the turning point. My husband went with me to a church in Memphis, Jana recalls. They didn't feel comfortable having a card table with my cassettes inside the church, so they put my card table out on their new parking lot. It had just been repaved and in ninety-five-degree weather, the asphalt was hot and black and gooey. After the parking lot finally emptied, we got in the car and turned on the air conditioning and began counting what we'd earned. To Jana's amazement, she had sold three hundred dollars worth of cassettes, fifty dollars more than she earned all week working a freelance TV job she had taken to help make ends meet. Holding that three hundred dollars in her hand made Jana realize for the first time that she could support herself doing what she loved to do. Today, Jana's company, Keynote Concerts, produces more than fifty motivational concerts a year for groups all over the world. She started her own recording company, Relatively Famous Records, which produced nine of Jana's CDs and has sold well over one hundred thousand copies. Jana's songs have been recorded by Reba McIntyre, Andy Williams, Susie Boggess, John Schneider, and Megan McDonough. She's opened for Kenny Loggins and toured with author Melody Beatty. Her heavy mental music has been featured on Oprah, 2020, Entertainment Tonight, and radio stations Coast to Coast, as well as in the movie Eight Seconds. Jana Stanfield achieved her dream of becoming a songwriter and recording star, all because she leaned into it and trusted the path that appeared. You, too, can get from where you are to where you want to be, if you'll just trust that if you lean into it, the path will appear. Sometimes it'll be like driving through the fog, where you can only see the road ten yards ahead of you. But if you keep moving forward, more of the road will be revealed, and eventually you will arrive at the goal. Pick an area of your life, career, financial, relationship, health and fitness, recreation, hobby, or contribution, that you would like to explore and just lean into it. Start now. Just do it. Of course, there is no perfect time to start. If you are into astrology and you want to contact your astrologer about an auspicious date to get married, open your store, launch a new product line, or begin a concert tour. Okay, that's fine. I can understand that. But for everything else, the best strategy is to just jump in and get started. Lean into it. Don't keep putting things off, waiting for twelve doves to fly over your house in the sign of a cross before you begin. Just start. You want to be a public speaker? Fine. Schedule a free talk for a local service club, school, or church group. Just having a date will put the pressure on you to start researching and writing your speech. If that's too big of a stretch, then join Toastmasters and take a speech class. You want to be in the restaurant business? Go get a job in a restaurant and start learning the business. You want to be a chef? Great. Enroll in a cooking school. Take action and get started today. You do not have to know everything to get going. Just get into the game. You will learn by doing. First, you jump off the cliff, and you build wings on the way down. Ray Bradbury, prolific American author of science fiction and fantasy. Don't get me wrong here. I am a big proponent of education, training, and skill building. If you need more training, then go and get it. Sign up for that class or that seminar now. You may need a coach or a mentor to get where you want to go. If so, then go get one. If you're afraid, so what? Feel the fear and do it anyway. The key 
is to just get started. Quit waiting until you are perfectly ready. You never will be. I started out my career as a history teacher in a Chicago high school. I was far from the perfect teacher on my first day of teaching school. I had a lot to learn about classroom control, effective discipline, how to avoid getting conned by a slick student, how to confront manipulative behavior, and how to motivate an unmotivated student. But I had to start anyway. And it was in the process of teaching that I learned all of those other things. Most of life is on the job training. Some of the most important things can only be learned in the process of doing them. You do something and you get feedback about what works and what doesn't. If you don't do anything for fear of doing it wrong, poorly, or badly, you never get any feedback, and therefore you never get to learn and improve. When I started my first business, a retreat and conference center in Amherst, Massachusetts, called the New England Center for Personal and Organizational Development, I went to a local bank to get a loan. The first bank I went to told me I needed to have a business plan. I didn't know what that was. But I went and bought a book on how to write a business plan. I wrote one up and took it to the bank. They told me there were a bunch of holes in my plan. I asked what they were, and they told me. I went back and rewrote the plan, filling in the areas I had left out or that were unclear or unconvincing. I then went back to the bank. They said the plan was good, but they wanted to pass. I asked them who might be willing to fund the plan. They gave me the names of several bankers in the area they thought might respond favorably. Again, I went off to bank after bank. Each one gave me more feedback until I had honed the plan and my presentation to the point where I did finally obtain the $20,000 loan that I needed. When Mark Victor Hansen and I first released Chicken Soup for the Soul, I thought it would be a good idea to sell the book in bulk quantity to some of the larger network marketing companies, thinking they could give them or resell them to their sales force to motivate them to believe in their dreams, take more risks, and therefore achieve greater success in selling. I got a list of all the companies that belonged to the Direct Marketing Association, and I started cold-calling the sales directors of the larger companies. Sometimes I couldn't get the sales director to take my call. Other times I was told, we're not interested. Several times I was actually hung up on. But eventually, after getting better at getting through to the right decision-maker and properly discussing the book's potential benefits, I made several significant sales. A few of the companies liked the book so much, they later hired me to speak at their national conventions. All because I leaned into it. Was I a little scared making cold calls? Yes. Did I know what I was doing when I started? No. I had never tried to sell mass quantities of books to anyone before. I had to learn as I went. But the most important point is that I just got started. I got into communication with the people I wanted to serve, found out what their dreams, aspirations, and goals were, and explored how our book might help them in achieving their objectives. Everything unfolded because I was willing to take a risk and jump into the ring. You, too, have to begin, from wherever you are, to start taking the actions that will get you to where you want to be. Principle 15 Experience your fear and take action anyway. We come this way but once. We can either tiptoe through life and hope that we get to death without being too badly bruised, or we can live a full, complete life, achieving our goals and realizing our wildest dreams. Bob Proctor Self-made millionaire, radio and TV personality, success trainer, and featured teacher in the movie and book The Secret. As you move forward on your journey from where you are to where you want to be, you're going to have to confront your fears. Fear is natural. Whenever you start a new project, take on a new venture, or put yourself out there, there is usually fear. Unfortunately, most people let fear stop them from taking the necessary steps to achieve their dreams. Successful people, on the other hand, feel the fear, along with the rest of us, 
but don't let it keep them from doing anything they want to do, or have to do. They understand that fear is something to be acknowledged, experienced, and taken along for the ride. They have learned, as author Susan Jeffers suggests, to feel the fear and do it anyway. I consider Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers to be a must-read book. I endorse this book, saying, should be required for every person who can read. Susan has been a friend for 20 years now, and her transformational work has helped millions of people move forward to create success in their lives. To find out more, visit www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Why are we so fearful? Millions of years ago, fear was our body's way of signaling us that we were out of our comfort zone. It alerted us to possible danger and gave us the burst of adrenaline we needed to run away. Unfortunately, though this response was useful in the days when saber-toothed tigers were chasing us, today most of our threats are not all that life-threatening. Today, fear is more of a signal that we must stay alert and cautious. We can feel fear, but we can still move forward anyway. Think of your fear as a two-year-old child who doesn't want to go grocery shopping with you. You wouldn't let a two-year-old's mentality run your life. Because you must buy groceries, you'll just have to take the two-year-old along with you. Fear is no different. In other words, acknowledge that fear exists, but don't let it keep you from doing important tasks. You have to be willing to feel the fear. Some people will do anything to avoid the uncomfortable feeling of fear. If you are one of those people, you run an even bigger risk of never getting what you want in life. Most of the good stuff requires taking a risk, and the nature of a risk is that it doesn't always work out. People do lose their investments. People do forget their lines. People do fall off mountains. People do die in accidents. But as the old adage so wisely tells us, nothing ventured, nothing gained. In 2009, Peter Douglas was a self-sufficient, successful businessman, rancher, and self-described cowboy who had pulled himself up by the bootstraps his whole life. As the result of a mistake made by the anesthesiologist during what was supposed to be a routine shoulder surgery, he found himself unable to grab his own bootstraps, much less pull on them. He woke up to discover that both his arms were totally paralyzed from the shoulders down. For the first time in his life, without the use of his hands, Peter felt helpless, which he describes as, that feeling you get when you know that you have to do something, but you just can't do it. After years of rehab, Peter still has only limited use of the fine motor skills in his hands. He has some triceps and forearm movement, and he can move his arms with difficulty, but as he describes it, his thumbs are not exactly opposable anymore. For the years following his surgery, he didn't go anywhere without his wife or someone else to help him, and he definitely wouldn't consider traveling by himself. The thought of being alone in a strange place terrified him. What if he needed help? What if he couldn't open his hotel room door by himself? What if? Then one day he decided enough was enough. Realizing that he was letting the fear of the unknown dictate his life and where he went, he finally made the decision to travel on his own. But each step of the way, he knew he would have to face and experience the fear of the next complication, obstacle, or stumbling block that might eventually cause him to throw up his hands, in theory at least, and say, that's it, I'm going home. But he was determined to work through the fear. And what he discovered is that, as he faced each fear, a solution appeared. Here's what Peter told me. Fear. I was afraid of the check-in at the airport. I didn't know if I'd have enough strength to swipe my credit card at the check-in kiosk. Solution. I asked the people at the airlines to help, and they were more than happy to assist. Fear. I was nervous about getting the seat belt buckled in. I wasn't sure I'd have enough grasp in my hand to do the task. Solution. The flight attendants were kind and helpful with the seat belt. Fear. I didn't know how I'd get things set up in my hotel room. Solution. Once I was in my room, the bell captain helped me unwrap the soap, set up the room, pull the curtains, unfold the covers, and unpack my luggage. Fear. 
I didn't know how I would get myself dressed flying solo. I still hadn't been able to get any of my clothes buttoned on my own. Solution. My wife packed all my shirts pre-buttoned, so I simply had to slip them on over my head. My pants had Velcro, so I could fasten them myself. My socks had loops that I could grab and pull. But there were still two buttons on my shirt that needed to be buttoned. Again, I asked for help. The first time I asked a hostess to do it, and she was taken aback. But now it's amazing. If I'm at the hotel for several days, the hostess will watch for me and step right up to help. Fear. I was afraid to eat by myself. I still can't cut meat, and I have difficulty with most flatware. Solution. I traveled with a special fork that allows me to feed myself. And now that I've traveled on my own several times, I can't tell you how many times people have offered to wash the fork for me and take special care of it. What I learned is that we have everything around us we need to erase fear. Just look to your left and to your right at the people around you. Are they strangers? Doesn't matter. There are amazing people at every step of my journey who don't just assist me. They literally jump at the chance to help another human being. The only way to find out if you can do something is to actually do it. As Peter says, it takes a little bit of trust, but the only way you will ever find out if you can fly solo is to experience your fear and take the leap and trust that you'll be okay. Peter still experiences some anxiety when he travels on his own, but most of the fear is gone and has been replaced with gratitude for all the assistance people continue to offer him. The reason I know Peter's story is that after facing that he would never rope cattle again, he decided he would like to pursue a career as a public speaker and a trainer. Having heard me speak, and after reading in The Success Principles that success leaves clues, he decided to attend my Train the Trainer program. He has since written a book called Cowboy Leadership and designed a speech, seminar, and workshop all based on his Saddle Up philosophy. You can learn more about Peter Douglas and his work at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Fantasized Experiences Appearing Real Another important aspect to remember about fear is that, as humans, we've also evolved to the stage where almost all of our fears are now self-created. We frighten ourselves by fantasizing negative outcomes to any activity we might pursue. Luckily, because we are the ones doing the fantasizing, we are also the ones who can stop the fear by facing the actual facts, rather than giving in to our imaginations. We can choose to be sensible. Psychologists like to say that fear means fantasized experiences appearing real. To help you better understand how we actually bring unfounded fear into our lives, make a list of the things you are afraid to do. This is not a list of things you are afraid of, such as being afraid of spiders, but things you are afraid to do, such as being afraid to pick up a spider. For example, I am afraid to... Ask my boss for a raise. Ask Sally out for a date. Go skydiving. Leave my kids alone with a sitter. Leave this job that I hate. Ask my friends to look at my new business opportunity. Delegate any part of my job to others. Now go back and restate each fear using the following format. I want to... blank and I scare myself by imagining blank. The key words are, I scare myself by imagining. All fear is self-created by imagining some negative outcome in the future. Using some of the same fears listed here, the new format would look like this. I want to ask my boss for a raise, and I scare myself by imagining he would say no and be angry with me for asking. I want to ask Sally out for a date, and I scare myself by imagining that she would say no and I would feel embarrassed. I want to leave this job I hate to pursue my dream, and I scare myself by imagining I would go bankrupt and lose my house. I want to ask my friends to look at my new network marketing business opportunity, and I scare myself by imagining they will think I am only interested in making money off of them.
I want to delegate part of my work to others, and I scare myself by imagining that they won't do it as well as I would. Can you see that you are the one creating the fear? How to Get Rid of Fear I have lived a long life and had many troubles, most of which never happened. Mark Twain, celebrated American author and humorist. One way to actually disappear your fear is to ask yourself what you're imagining that is scary to you, and then replace that image with its positive opposite. When I was flying to Orlando recently to give a talk, I noticed the woman next to me was gripping the arms of her seat so tightly her knuckles were turning white. I introduced myself, told her I was a trainer, and said I couldn't help but notice her hands. I asked her, Are you afraid? Yes. Would you be willing to close your eyes and tell me what thoughts or images you are experiencing in your head? After she closed her eyes, she replied, I just keep imagining the plane not getting off the runway and crashing. I see. Tell me, what are you headed to Orlando for? I'm going there to spend four days with my grandchildren at Disney World. Great. What's your favorite ride at Disney World? It's a small world. Wonderful. Can you imagine being at Disney World in one of the gondolas with your grandchildren in the It's a Small World attraction? Yes. Can you see the smiles and the looks of wonder on your grandchildren's faces as they watch all the little puppets and figures from the different countries bobbing up and down and spinning around? Uh-huh. At that point, I started to sing, It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. Her face relaxed, her breathing deepened, and her hands released their grip on the arms of the seat. In her mind, she was already at Disney World. She had replaced the catastrophic picture of the plane crashing with a positive image of her desired outcome, and instantly her fear disappeared. You can use this same technique to disappear any fear that you might ever experience. Replace the physical sensations fear brings. Another technique that works for relieving fear is to focus on the physical sensations you're currently feeling, sensations you're probably just identifying as fear. Next, focus on those feelings you would like to be experiencing instead, courage, self-confidence, calm, joy. Fix these two different impressions firmly in your mind's eye. Then, slowly shuttle back and forth between the two, spending about 15 seconds in each one. After a minute or two, the fear will dissipate, and you will find yourself in a neutral, centered place. Remember when you triumphed in the face of fear. Did you ever learn to dive off a diving board? If so, you probably remember the first time you walked to the edge of the board and looked down. The water looked a lot deeper than it really was, and considering the height of the board and the height of your eyes above the board, it probably looked like a very long way down. You were scared. But did you look at your mom or dad or the diving instructor and say, You know, I'm just too afraid to do this right now. I think I'll do some therapy on this, and if I can get rid of my fear, I'll come back and try again. No, you didn't say that. You felt the fear somehow mustered up courage from somewhere, and jumped into the water. You felt the fear and did it anyway. When you surfaced, you probably swam like crazy to the side of the pool and took a few well-earned deep breaths. Somewhere there was a little rush of adrenaline, the thrill of having survived a risk, plus the thrill of jumping through the air into the water. After a minute, you probably did it again, and then again and again enough to where it got to be really fun. Pretty soon, all of the fear was gone, and you were doing cannonballs to splash your friends and maybe even learning how to do a backflip. If you can remember that experience, or the first time you drove a car, or the first time you kissed someone on a date, you've got the model for everything that happens in life. New experiences may feel a little scary. That's the way it works. But every time you face a fear and do it anyway, you build up that much more confidence in your abilities. Scale down the risk. Anthony Robbins says, If you can't, you must. And if you must, you can.
I agree. It is those very things that we are most afraid to do that provide the greatest liberation and growth for us. If a fear is so big that it paralyzes you, scale down the amount of risk, take on smaller challenges, and work your way up. If you're starting your first job in sales, call on prospects or customers you think will be the easiest to sell to first. If you're asking for money for your business, practice on those lending sources whom you wouldn't want to get a loan from anyway. If you're anxious about taking on new responsibilities at work, start by asking to do parts of a project you're interested in. If you're learning a new sport, start at lower levels of skill. Master those skills you need to learn, move through your fears, and then take on bigger challenges. When your fear is really a phobia. Some fears are so strong that they can actually immobilize you. If you have a full-blown phobia, such as fear of flying or fear of being in an elevator, it can seriously inhibit your ability to be successful. Fortunately, there is a simple solution to most phobias. The five-minute phobia cure, developed by Dr. Roger Callahan, is easy to learn and can be self-administered as well as facilitated by a professional. I learned about this magical technique from Dr. Callahan's book and video, and have used it successfully in my seminars for more than 15 years. If you have a phobia that is holding you back, visit www.rogercallahan.com for a free guide and other self-help materials. You can also schedule private consultations or find a practitioner near you at www.tftpractitioners.net. The process uses a simple but precise pattern of tapping on various acupressure points of the body while you simultaneously imagine the object or experience that stimulates your phobic reaction. It acts in much the same way as a virus in a computer program by permanently interrupting the program or sequence of events that occur in the brain between the initial sighting of the thing you are afraid of, such as seeing a snake or stepping into an airplane, and the physical response, such as sweating, shaking, shallow breathing, or weak knees you experience. When I was leading a seminar for real estate agents, a woman revealed that she had a phobia about walking upstairs. In fact, she had experienced it that very morning, when in response to her request for directions to the seminar, the bellman had pointed to a huge staircase leading to the grand ballroom. Fortunately, there was also an elevator, so she made it to the seminar. If there hadn't been, she would have turned around and driven home. She admitted that she had never been on the second floor of any home she had ever sold. She would pretend she had already been up there, tell the prospective buyers what they would find on the second floor on the basis of her reading of the listing sheet, and then let them explore it on their own. I did the five-minute phobia cure with her, and then took all 100 people out to the same hotel stairway that had petrified her earlier in the day. With no hesitation, heavy breathing, or drama, she walked up and down the stairs twice. It is that simple. Take a leap. Come to the edge, he said. They said, we are afraid. Come to the edge, he said. They came. He pushed them, and they flew. Guillaume Apollinaire, avant-garde French poet. All the successful people I know have been willing to take a chance, a leap of faith, even though they were afraid. Sometimes they were terrified, but they knew if they didn't act, the opportunity would pass them by. They trusted their intuition, and they simply went for it. Progress always involves risk. You can't steal second base and keep your foot on first. Frederick Wilcox, American author. Mike Kelly lives in paradise and owns several companies under the umbrella of beach activities of Maui. With only a year of college under his belt, he never did return to get his degree. Mike left Las Vegas at age 19 for the islands of Hawaii and ended up selling suntan lotion by the pool at a hotel in Maui. From these humble beginnings, Mike went on to create a company with 175 employees and over $5 million in annual revenues that provides catamaran and scuba diving excursions for tourists, 
plus concierge services and business centers for many of the island's hotels. Mike credits much of his success to always being willing to take a leap when needed. When Beach Activities of Maui was attempting to expand its business, there was an important hotel whose business he wanted, but a competitor had held the contract for over 15 years. To maintain a competitive edge, Mike always reads the trade journals and keeps an ear open to what is happening in his business. One day he read that this hotel was changing general managers, and the new general manager who would be coming in lived in Copper Mountain, Colorado. This got Mike thinking. Because it's so hard to get through all of the gatekeepers to secure a meeting with the general manager, maybe he should try to contact him before he actually moved to Hawaii. Mike wrestled with what would be the best way to contact him. Should he write a letter? Should he call him on the phone? As he pondered these options, his friend Doug suggested, Why don't you just hop on a plane and go see him? Always one to take action and take it now. Mike quickly put together a pro forma and a proposal and hopped on a plane the next night. After flying all night, he arrived in Colorado, rented a car, and drove the two hours out to Copper Mountain, showing up unannounced at the new general manager's office. Mike explained who he was, congratulated the general manager on his new promotion, told him that he looked forward to having him in Maui, and asked for a few moments to tell him about beach activities of Maui and what it could do for his hotel. Mike didn't get the contract during that first meeting. But the fact that a young kid was so confident in himself and his business that he would take a leap of faith, jump on a plane, fly all the way to Denver, then drive out into the middle of Colorado on the off chance that he would be able to meet in person, left such a huge impression on the general manager that, when he did finally get to Hawaii, he awarded Mike the contract which was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to Mike's bottom line over the ensuing 15 years. Taking a leap can transform your life. Authority is 20% given and 80% taken. So take it. Peter Uberoth, organizer of the 1984 Summer Olympics and commissioner of Major League Baseball, 1984-1988. Multi-millionaire Dr. John Demartini is a resounding success by anyone's standards. He owns several homes in Australia. He spent over 60 days a year for several years together circumnavigating the globe with his wife in their $3 million luxury apartment on board the $550 million Osher liner World of Residency a residence they purchased after selling their Trump Tower apartment in New York City. The author of 54 training programs and 13 books, and a featured teacher in the movie The Secret, John spends the year traveling the world speaking and conducting his courses on financial success and life mastery. But John didn't start out rich and successful. At age seven, he was found to have a learning disability and was told that he would never read, write, or communicate normally. At 14, he dropped out of school, left his Texas home, and headed for the California coast. By 17, he had ended up in Hawaii, surfing the waves of Oahu's famed North Shore, where he almost died from strychnine poisoning. His road to recovery led him to Dr. Paul Bragg, a 93-year-old man who changed John's life by giving him one simple affirmation to repeat. I am a genius and I apply my wisdom. Inspired by Dr. Bragg, John went to college, earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Houston, and later earned his doctoral degree from the Texas College of Chiropractic. When he opened his first chiropractic office in Houston, John started with just 970 square feet of space. Within nine months, he'd more than doubled that and was offering free classes on healthy living. When attendance grew, John was ready to expand again. It was then that he took a leap that changed his career forever. It was Monday, John said. The shoe store next door had vacated over the weekend. What a perfect lecture hall, John thought, as he quickly phoned the leasing company. When no one called him back, John concluded they weren't going to rent the space soon. So he took a leap. I called the locksmith to come out and open up the place, John said. 
I thought the worst thing they would do was charge me rent. He quickly transformed the space into a lecture hall, and within days was holding free talks there on a nightly basis. Because the space was located right next to a movie theater, he added a loudspeaker so moviegoers could hear his lectures as they walked to their cars. Hundreds began attending classes and eventually became patients. John's practice grew rapidly. Yet nearly six months went by before the property manager came to investigate. You've got a lot of courage, the manager said. You remind me of me. In fact, he was so impressed with John's daring, he even gave John six months free rent. Anybody that has the courage to do what you did deserves it, he told him. The manager later invited John down to his office, where he offered him a quarter of a million dollars a year to come to work for him. John turned it down because he had other plans, but it was a huge validation of his courage to act. Taking a leap helped John build a thriving practice, which he later sold to begin consulting full-time with other chiropractors. Taking that leap opened up a doorway for me, John said. If I'd held back, if I had been cautious, I wouldn't have made the breakthrough that gave me the life I live today.